All right, welcome. So in the last video, we just got some of the foundations down so that we could start talking about computation. And in this video, I want to introduce our first model of computation, the deterministic finite automata or uh, a DFA, uh, also known as a state machine. So to get us start us started, let's think at an abstract level about what computation is. So computation, uh, we typically say, is an information process. So what does that mean? We're processing information. Well, uh, usually the way that we represent this, at least in terms of the problems that we solve, is that there's going to be some information that we're taking for granted, the input information, and then we want to process that in some way to produce some output information. And that's what we mean by an information process, or that's what we mean by computation. So we introduced in the last uh, video this idea of language membership that's going to be a problem that we're going to focus on in this series of videos videos so I've got it here actually stated as an information processing problem so we've got sort of the name here I'm just calling it language membership for some given L our input is going to be some string over the alphabet that uh, this L is defined on and here I'm being agnostic about what that alphabet might be so just some string over this alphabet and the output is going to be yes if that string is in the language that we've got defined for this particular problem or no if it's not and uh, that makes it a very simple kind of problem it's a kind of problem called a decision problem and um, you'll notice that what this problem does, this information processing problem, is it links for us the input with the output expectation. So it's going to be a relationship between the input and the output, but it never tells us how to get from the input to the output. So that problem itself just tells us what the expectations of the computation are, and the computation itself is what's going to carry us from the input to the output. So to carry out the computation, we need something to do that. In the real world, that means like a machine of some kind. We need a computer or a calculator or some kind of device whose job it is to process information. Um, but in the theoretical world, what that means is we need some kind of rules about how such a device might work. Um, so for instance, the, the computers that we're used to, we might have rules about you know binary bits being passed into registers and being flipped and so on. That's how the von Neumann machine that our, our computer works uh, is designed on and, and we can describe those rules in a theoretical space. We tend to not want to get so detailed as talking about the actual you know performances of chips that's way too detailed we want to abstract way away from that and so in our processes our models of computation are going to be a lot more simple than than uh, a modern computer uh, but we're going to use that as a way to talk about the limits of computing and uh, even of our modern computers so in our theoretical space we can think of a model of computation as just telling us what are the allowable operations that we can perform on the data on the information and then maybe Maybe later on not so much in this series we can talk also about the cost of those operations and then talk about uh, how with the cost of the computation so as I mentioned in this video we're going to be talking about a simple model called the deterministic finite automata and I you're already familiar with them so I'm going to give you a very simple example of that which is going to be the light switch so the light switch has two states that it can be in, it can be on or off, at least the simplest light switch, the one depicted here. And the way you move it from one state to the other is you flip the switch. So that's a physical action that we can do. We can flip the switch and it will change it from one state to the other. The purpose of this particular machine, this particular automata, is to activate lights in our house. So you turn on uh, the light so that you can see and you turn it off when you don't need it anymore. This is a very, very simple machine, probably the simplest kind of state machine that you can design. And you can probably look around your you know, your space right now and find a handful of other simple machines that work in this very simple state way. Another one that we often use is say a door or a garage door, uh, open and close are the two states and so on. There are a few others out there that you might be able to look at. Other simple ones that uh, stand out are like a clock. It has lots of states, but it just iterates. That's a special kind of state machine we call a counter um, that just sort of iterates through the same states over and over again, but it helps us keep track of where we're at in time. Um, or, and then other things like our phone and our television and so on, these are all special states 
that state machines that have states that we can change them from one state to another. We can change the channel on our TV. We can change the volume on our machine. We can change the app we're using on our phone. There's lots of states that you change in these different machines. We've gotten very used to having these types of state machines in our environment. And on the fundamental level, this is all we have in our environment, our very special purpose state machines. But as we'll see as the series progresses, theoretically, we might want to think of them in more abstract ways or, or different ways, at least. So this is a simple example. Let's look at a, uh, an example from the context of the theory of computing instead of uh, real world information processing. So this is what we will call a deterministic finite automata. This is a diagram of one, and I'm going to describe its pieces in a bit. Um, and this is a very special one. Maybe we'll give it a name because it's a specific one. It's not a, an abstract one. Uh, so I'm going to give it the name M1 or M if we just wanted to give it a name, M for machine. Um, and then um, we can sort of see that there are ones and zeros depicted here. That's helping us understand that this particular machine is for binary strings. It will do something with binary strings. It will process strings over our standard default alphabet. So let's look a little bit closer now. Th these circles here, uh, uh, indicated in red, are the states of the machine. So we sometimes call this a state machine, uh, and it has states. And then what happens in a state machine is you move from one state to another. You transition from a state to another. So all the arrows in this are, are, are transitions. Now what you'll notice is this is just a graph. All we've drawn here is a graph that has nodes and edges perhaps is another way to think of it. But when we think of this particular graph as a state machine, we give it a name, a label, then we usually change the names. We don't call them nodes and edges anymore. We start calling them uh, uh, states and transitions. Uh, one of our states is the initial start state, the state where uh, processing begins when we start up the machine. And to indicate that, we have an arrow that comes in from no state. It looks like it's a transition, but it's from nowhere. That's where we start. That's just indicating where we start. Um, and we start processing the input there. Now, the way we process the input is we're going to process it one character at a time. As that string, we're going to read the string from left to right as a standard by following the transitions that are labeled with the appropriate input. So for instance, if we start in the start state, we have one transition that tells us where to go if we got a zero, and we have another transition which tells us where to go if we got a one. The double circle here, this is a special state. Uh, that tells us that what we're in is an accepting state. And an accepting state means that if after we've processed all of the string, where there's no more input left to process, if we're in one of these states, then we say, yes, this string should be accepted. It's part of the language that we've been designed to detect. And otherwise, if it ends up in one of the non-accepting states, which is any of the ones without a double circle, then that means we reject. So no, this string was not part of the set that we were detecting. So let's do an example. Let's process this string 0110 using this machine here. So we're going to start in our start state. We're going to process the 0, which means we remain in this state. We don't change states. Then we process the 1. We'll follow this transition that leads us to our next state over here, our second state. Then we get another 1 that toggles us back to the first state. And then we get a final zero, which leaves us in this state. And as it says here, uh, because that's the end of our string and we end up in an accepting state, we accept this string. So whatever language this uh, machine is designed to uh, accept or recognize, this string is part of that language and we should accept it or it does accept it. So we might ask ourselves, what is the language that is accepted by this machine? So what are we even asking when we ask that question? We are asking, what, are, what is the set of strings that is accepted? Which strings are accepted and which ones are, are not? That's sort of the hidden uh, uh, second part of the question, which is this machine divides all of the binary strings into two sets the ones that it says yes to, and the ones that it says no to. And we can describe those sets by giving them a name and, and talking about the property in some, hopefully using English and natural language with a little bit of set theory or math sprinkled in there to be formal, we should be able to name what it is. So one thing I want us to think about here is I want us to think about these states now as embodying something about the strings, okay? 
Well, notice that these two strings, or the, sorry, these two states, we move between them whenever we get a one. So on the left hand, let's just think for a second. If we had zero ones, we start out on the left hand state. If we get one one, we move to the right hand state and now we're rejecting. If we get a second one, we're back to the accepting. And if we get a third one, we're back to rejecting. And a fourth, we're back to accepting. So it's something about the ones that matters, right? How many ones we've got. And what we can see is every second one, we're back to accepting. Meaning, if we had an even number, that's what this state seems to be. If we have an even number of ones, we're accepting. But if we had an odd number of ones, we're over here, we're rejecting. So this machine, detects if we have an even number of ones. That's the language that this machine was designed to recognize. Okay, this language here, L, all the strings W from our binary, so we were focused on binary strings, such that W has an even number of ones, an even number of ones. Now let's just do a quick test of our understanding here. Let's think for a second, what is what would we have to change about this machine if instead we wanted to detect the an odd number of ones? Okay, and it's a simple change. We just need to switch which state is accepting, right? If this one's the even one and this one's the odd one, we should just change that to the accepting state. Then we will be detecting a different language, the odd numbered ones. Okay, here's another one that we might just quickly test. What if it wasn't the ones we wanted, it was the zeros? We want to know if we have an even number of zeros. What change do we need to make? Well, now we should swap the labels of our, our transitions. The looping ones, the self-loop ones, the loops that go back to the same state, those are ones. We should ignore ones now, and instead, we should toggle back and forth when we get zeros. So these are simple changes that we can make to this machine to now detect different languages than the one it's currently designed to detect. Okay, so I've mentioned this already a couple times, but I'll just highlight it one last time, that when a DFA, a deterministic finite automata, accepts the strings in a particular language, like we've just seen that this machine does, then we will say that it recognizes that language. We might also say it accepts that language, which is a sloppier use of language, but we sometimes do that. So we might say it accepts the language or it recognizes the language. And that's, um, that's how we're gonna determine if a particular um, DFA or state machine is well defined or well designed, I guess, is that we've designed it in a way so that it accepts exactly and only those strings in the language that we were designing it for. All right. Thanks a lot for watching and we'll see you in that next video.